The Midway class of carriers started life in 1940. The Essex class had been designed free of treaty restrictions, but was to some extent still an iterative design that grew from the Yorktowns. Partially because that was easier, and partially because it was faster, with the US Navy appreciating that they would likely need the carriers sooner rather than later. But with that done, there was an opportunity for a clean slate design, where the US Navy's designers could start to address some of the new developments in aerial warfare. Coupled with this was a wealth of free wartime experience that the US Navy was gaining without actually having to be at war, courtesy largely of the Royal Navy, who were suddenly racking up a lot of wartime carrier operational experience and were happy to share, in part in exchange for dockyard space to repair damaged carriers, which in turn allowed the US even closer analysis of these British warships. This, along with impressive performance by dive bombers on both sides in the Norway campaign and further effective use of these aircraft by the Germans in the Mediterranean, coupled with a number of similar scenarios that playing out in the US Navy's pre-war fleet problems, strongly influenced the idea of an armoured flight deck as being the way forward. However, as compared to the British carriers, the US Navy also wanted to retain the ability to warm aircraft up while still in the hangar, and was somewhat underwhelmed by the hangar height constraints and lower freeboard that resulted from the British approach of armouring their carriers' sides and hangar decks as well. And so the first concepts to come off the drawing board reflected a hybrid approach, a British-style armoured flight deck, but US Navy-style open-sided hangars. There were two further major areas of discussion, whether to go with multiple thinner armour decks on several levels, or a single thicker deck. The idea of the first one was to initiate the bomb's fuse high up in the ship and then block the fragments, but ultimately it was concluded that an enemy who simply changed their fuse to a slightly longer delay could defeat this measure since a heavy armour-piercing bomb would smash through any realistic number of thin decks. Instead, a single heavy deck was chosen with a view to stopping the bombs cold outside the ship. The other consideration was whether or not the ship needed 8-inch guns. This was due to US Navy tactics at this point calling for fast carrier raids on supply lines and other enemy forces, where it was felt the chances were fairly high of running into fast enemy cruisers, supercruisers and battle cruisers. The fate of HMS Gloria seemed to bear this out, and the US Navy was worryingly short of their own cruisers, since they expected to have to split their theoretically larger fleet over many roles, whilst the Imperial Japanese Navy could concentrate their own cruisers into a much more limited number of very specific offensive war roles. The idea of the 8-inch guns was to keep enemy cruisers at range, thus allowing either the carrier to escape or its escorts to deal with the problem before damage got too bad. Dual-purpose 6-inch guns were also considered for this purpose, based on rate of fire and greater anti-aircraft capability. However, reports of the effectiveness of radar coming from the Royal Navy, along with news of the new 5-inch 54 caliber gun, which with its longer barrel would provide for both long-range anti-aircraft firepower and relatively long-range anti-surface firepower, lessened the perceived need for heavy guns, since with radar you'd be able to both run and get a strike airborne to deal with cruisers, and so surface actions with high speed and harder to detect destroyers would remain the only major issue, and a 5-inch shell would do quite nicely for dealing with that problem. Nine designs were submitted, labelled CVA through CVI, of which CVE, not to be confused with the escort carrier designation CVE, was selected. This brought a 45,000 tonne ship capable of 33 knots using 212,000 shaft horsepower on four shafts to the table with a 3.5 inch thick armoured flight deck, a 7.6 inch thick armoured belt and an anti-aircraft battery of the aforementioned 5 inch guns along with 40mm bofors. An air group of 120 was planned, although it was anticipated that this would drop to the mid-80s when some of the larger naval aircraft then in development were brought into service. At a hair over 900 feet long at the waterline, these vessels were massive, larger even than an Iowa-class battleship. By 1942, the basic design, which was revised with more anti-aircraft guns to now carry 18 of the new 5-inch 54 dual-purpose guns along with 21 quad 40mm bofors and over two dozen 20mm orlicans, was ready. 
and then spent most of the year paused whilst the Navy argued with the President as to whether a few larger carriers or many smaller escort-sized carriers should be authorised. After a lot of pressure and not a few delays, the Midways were eventually authorised. The Navy had wanted four, but were allowed two at the end of 1942, with a third added in May 1943. Originally, the first pair were to have been named Midway and Coral Sea, in keeping with the US Navy's policy at the time of naming carriers after battles, and they were laid down in late 1943. But then, around the same time as Coral Sea's launch in early 1945, uh, President Roosevelt suffered an inconvenient cessation of existence, and his successor, President Truman, authorised the change of the ship's name to USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, thus starting a new tradition in US Navy carrier names. The name Coral Sea was duly moved to the third vessel, which started construction in mid-1944 and launched in early 1946, with a revised, larger island after negative feedback on the minimal island that was built on the first two ships, which had commissioned in late 1945, whilst the new Coral Sea would not commission until late 1947. These ships would go on to have a long and interesting history, with many modifications during their service. But that's the subject for another video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.